Good afternoon, I'm Donato Kiniger Pasilli, Vice President of the World Academy of Art and Science. Thank you, thank you all, thank you Yuri for the opportunity, the Moscow State University. Uh, I think that our session uh, that will be animated by several speakers, fellows of the Academy, is uh, by all means a, 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 a continuation of the previous one and certainly will link into the, uh, the second part of this afternoon, uh, of this late afternoon, with uh, Carlos Pereira that I see here, that probably wants even to uh, uh, interact with us as many others. So we have several speakers. I want to name them now because I would like them to be prepared. Uh, and uh, we don't have a precise order at this point. Uh, time has to be more compressed. But I want to name them, then I will introduce them uh, one by one. We have Elif Chepney, we have Obiora Aik, uh, Olivia Bina, Alberto Zucconi, Jerome Glenn, Pavel Luxa, and Jonathan Granov, that I see in front of me. So, uh, I mean, I, I will just take a, a few minutes of introduction and then uh, start with Pavel, because Pavel will have to leave us soon. Uh, as you know, the, the World Academy uh, is into a specific research with the United Nations on global leadership in the 21st century. This program is ongoing already for several months, and we have uh, a date in mind in terms of uh, rendition of what is our research, of what is the analytical work that we are doing at present through our ranks, but also through many other experts and specialists, and I would like to say uh, uh, um, individuals who are interested in uh, uh, multidisciplinary sciences. I mean, this is the um, World Academy, uh, we have uh, this particular distinguo, we have these characteristics of uh, having interest in uh, a plethora of uh, human sciences uh, and uh, maintaining this particular uh, human uh, conception. So the, uh, the, the, the real um, specificity of our research is indeed around the concept of leadership, but not as individual leadership. Uh, eventually even as collective leadership. Uh, we will try even to address the fact uh, whether the United Nations holds a soft power or not, uh, because we have been called in by the United Nations to um, really reassess, analyze where multilateralism stands. What are the opportunities at this critical juncture, especially in the post-COVID era? Um, what should be done to revitalize this concept, to revitalize uh, the uh, collective effort uh, to have a better world. So um, I, I don't want to indulge in this concept, but uh, definitely we have several steps. We have one step that sh you should keep in mind is this uh, online conference starting the 15th of June. Uh, you're all invited if you look into our website you will find uh, that there is an invitation uh, to come in with proposals, with ideas uh, and uh, uh, suggestions. Many are, are flowing in. Actually, uh, Gary could confirm that we are swamped, literally swamped with uh, uh, ideas, proposals uh, that deal obviously with art and humanities. Um, and in terms of reforming our, our, our way of working, our way of living, a way of preserving our planet uh, and, and, and its ecosystem. So this is our objective. We have this uh, uh, e-conference, electronic conference, as I was mentioning, coming up. And then we will have a conference at the United Nations um, in Geneva, yes. in the largest uh, possible room, uh, because uh, now we know for sure that we have uh, a large public uh, uh, and uh, uh, many attendees, uh, but uh, the, um, the gist of this operation is really to work collectively with you. 
so we we want your contribution and, and we cannot do it without you. Um, whatever we are going to come up with is going to be refined uh, as, as thinking and as proposals, because we would like, uh, as humble as we are, we would like to come up with catalytic strategies with proposals that can be applicable. Uh, and uh, after that, have also an educational program that can be inserted on top of our findings, on top of our research, that, as I said, is going to be shared with all of you. Now, as a product to the discussion that we have today, that, as you know, is called in the search for pathways to global transformation. So it's really centered around the concept of leadership, this special uh, session that we are having, uh, I would like to uh, recall uh, the words of one of our founding fathers uh, that has been named before, it's been named today by, by Gary Jacobs and uh, by Yuri and others, uh, Robert Oppenheimer. Um, he uh, <laughs> offered us an analogy between pathways, human pathways and research that I think is particularly fitting our context when he said that he explored the paths uh, which connect people, which connect villages, which connect men and women at work in art and science. And he argued in favor of the more secluded, the more intimate paths, that Daedalus of uh, small winding roads that should be preferred in his views to the superhighways. For humans, uh, and for humans to explore um, the different directions in which we are going. So that was this particular call that was uh, raised over 60 years ago. So the, the academy was not founded yet, but in this uh, remarkable uh, speech that he delivered at the Columbia University, uh, he made this call, let's say, that in my opinion really uh, uh, remind us the importance of the of, of humanity, really of, of what is the center of gravity that is humans. Is also talking about diversity. Is talking about interdependencies. So these are the old concepts that uh, Oppenheimer was raising, as he was a physicist, but he was also a humanist. He also offered us a wonderful syllogism that I want to, to use to kickstart our discussion. And I, I, I read it. He said, if a prospect is not a prophecy, it is a view. I find this, this syllogist, this, this short sentence, fabulous. Uh, and I'm sure you also find it fabulous, as I do, because it says it all. It says the fact that, of course, we cannot predict the future but we can offer our views. And we at the Academy offer our views. We want to offer our views with you uh, to, to build a better future for humanity. I want to start now with uh, the discussion and call the first speaker uh, is, uh, I hope that Pavel is with us. Pavel, can you raise your hands? Oh, hand. yes, I'm here. Pavel, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Fantastic. Pavel, uh, you are, uh, Pavel Luksha is professor at the Moscow School of Management and he is a leader in innovation and educational program. He's also founder of the Global Educational Futures Institute. Pavel, uh, a quick question for you. Uh, what pathways do you prefer? Do you prefer the highways or you prefer the small winding up roads? Well, I think I think we we deserve a combination because uh, uh, a good road work uh, system, like in uh, France, for example, which has the densest uh, network of roads, has has that combination. So you can take a, a, a fast highway, but you can also quickly switch to uh, winding road, but which can take you to really particular places. So we need a combination. That. And in terms of uh, establishing the global governance for the global transformation, I think we need a, 
a, a, a combination of uh, very different institutions that would uh, combine these qualities. <clears throat> and so, actually, I know that we have limited time, and so there are only three or four minutes for a speaker, so I will not uh, make a long introduction. But listening to the previous session, I think, um, even from what I hear, I, I sense that we still are attacking, uh, let's say, nuances and peculiarities rather than try to look at systemic roots of uh, the crisis we are facing. And when we talk about the climate crisis, it's a symptom of much more, let's say, fundamental crisis of uh, overshooting the planetary boundaries um, that our civilization ha has finally reached. Uh, when we talk about uh, the crisis of inequality or, or different aspects of political crisis, it's, it's an aspect of the crisis of complexity, our civilization evolving to become increasingly complex, and as some uh, scholars of that dynamics, uh, such as Joseph Tainter, have shown, it's actually that the, uh, the, the many complex societies of the past collapsed because of uh, in, inadequacy of uh, their own culture, inability to manage the complex, the complexity of, of, their, uh, of their civilization itself, its, its own institutions. The, and so on. So we, we are dealing with much more fundamental uh, crisis that basically challenges the whole model of, of the present civilization. So when we talk about the, the global transformation, the question is, what is that transformation towards? And so it's, it's, it's essentially a change of a paradigm. I think a lot of people in this, in this room share. The, the, and, but but what, what is the essence of the new paradigm? I think the idea of Creating civilization that is sustainable is not enough. We need to think about civilization that is evolutionary stable, that is able to continue evolve for many millennia in the future. And that would uh, be based on the principles of thriving, of flourishing, that would uh, enable flourishing for every living being on the planet, uh, not only humans, but other uh, living beings that entails the post-anthropocentric worldview that we need to cultivate. So it's a very multidimensional process that we are entering into that is not just uh, the matter of changing the, the governance institutions such as UN. It's, it's much, much more fundamental. And it's a transition that may take uh, decades at least, or maybe even hundreds of years. And so in that regard, the question is, how do we establish that? And yes, we need uh, large-scale superstructures that can accompl uh, accomplish that uh, transition. Uh, nation states will, they will, will probably be there for quite a long time. Uh, superstructures of 20th century will remain and will play their role, but we need to establish new uh, governance systems. We need to establish new uh, pathways. For example, the idea is that there are a lot of people that are, are, try to operate in the grassroots level as movements, as, as local initiatives, and, uh, and the number of people and institutions that try to operate in the, let's say, higher ground. There is a lack of institutions that actually connect these, these two, the, the, well, let's say, meso level, something that would be able to connect those, let's say, little roads and those highways, those uh, small-scale initiatives, localized initiatives, and global initiatives. That's one thing that we need to focus on. We need to focus on creating. In order to th create those things, we need to establish a new models of leadership. We are working with that a lot in education. We call it ecosystemic leadership in education. This is uh, leadership based on, let's say, organic and complexity premises. But we see the same type of leadership emerging in many, many other sectors of uh, economy and society, from urban development to transportation, ICT, many other sectors. It's a different premise, the idea of holding the complexity and enabling many players, multi-stakeholder systems to evolve uh, as a whole, evolve and not be directed and governed. So that's a different, let's say, level of uh, complexity that, that is put into the governance systems. In order to hold these uh, processes, we need uh, three at least three types of uh, social institutions to work together. We need education to focus on uh, skills of the future and uh, new ways of thinking. Uh, 
uh, we need uh, academy, academia to actually focus on new ways of knowing and cultivating the knowledge and modeling uh, the knowledge that is actionable, that is practical, that is brought into uh, prototypes, into new forms of uh, acting. Uh, we need also uh, to start experimenting with new models of governance, political structures, business structures, and so on. And last but not least, maybe that's what I want to conclude with. I think when we talk about all of these things, the most essential thing is that we model the change that we talk about. We, uh, unless we, people who think about it, become um, uh, not just uh, sensors, not just uh, sense makers of the change that is needed, but we become the model of the change. We prototype the system that needs to come into being in the world. Unless we do it by ourselves, this change will not come. So in the end, the pathway to transition in my, or the global transformation, in my opinion, is us, the communities of global change leaders that are sensing the need, that are establishing the need, and that are bringing communities of change leaders together. Thank you. Thank you, Pavel. You answered, uh, not only you answered the question, you expanded over the, the, whole, the whole issue, but uh, you remarked uh, fundamentally that we need both. We need uh, the superstructures and we need the human dimension uh, altogether in order to transform society. Uh, please stay with us. And I would like to ask the uh, following uh, speakers to um, keep their time, uh, five minutes maximum, please, because we are really exceeding uh, the time allotted to, to us uh, altogether, not us, but because of the uh, uh, delay previously accumulated. Uh, so please, let's be short, and I will eventually send you a chat to say the time is over. So please uh, look at that. Uh, the next uh, speaker, and again, the question is a bit the same. Uh, uh, do we need superstructures, or do we need uh, uh, more intimate paths in order to reform our society in terms of the leadership that we want to cultivate? Uh, the question is, this time, is addressed to Elif, Elif Chapney. Are you there, please? Elif, yes. Hi, hi, Donata. I am here. I am here. Elif. Oh, nice to, nice to see you, Elif. So, okay. uh, Elif is uh, the dean of the business school of Karabuk University in, uh, uh, in Turkey. And she's also professor of economics and behavioral sciences. Um, so, well, as I said, the, the lingering question is, is the one that comes from uh, our own history, uh, from Oppenheim. But the more precise question is, uh, what are the values that we think we should embody? Um, and, and how do you reconcile individual values with collective values, if these values are, fundamental of, are of fundamental importance to change our society? Uh, hi to everyone. Uh, thank you, Donato. Thank you to all of you. I took very fruitful notes from each speaker. Uh, my, my speech will be on, uh, in, in this post-normal time, how we can redefine value. What is value? Some companies are creating value. Some of them are extracting value. Some of them are transforming values. But uh, we just measure uh, their values with some commercial uh, values. So uh, as we all know, individual and collective interests, generally, they don't overlap. So that's why uh, we need new reforms, new perhaps uh, regulations in, in some markets, in almost all markets, in the goods market, in the labor market, in the uh, money market. Why I say this? Because, uh, you know, this time period is called post-normal times, as you all know. We are surrounded with unknown unknowns, contradictions and complexities and chaos. Uh, complexity means what? When small parts, agents, are coming together, the whole picture is bigger than these parts. So uh, we, we are surrounded uh, with these complex markets. And that's why it is not easy to make predictions. Uh, we need to change, as previous speakers said, the ways of our thinking, but it is easier said than done. 
we need, I think, independent independence of independent authorities. We have UN, wonderful officials, experts, scientists, but as you all know, countries, they try to be involved in the decision-making process of these independent institutions with their financial contributions. So perhaps uh, this pandemic showed us what, uh, for our common problems, uh, perhaps uh, we need to assign bigger independence to these authorities because I don't want to blame politicians, but of course scientists, uh, they know uh, more than uh, politicians and they can come together, they can work together and they can uh, offer better solutions to our, I think, common problems. So to define, redefine value, uh, what is value? And because there are some important sayings, some uh, scientists, they improve our, uh, the quality of our life, but sometimes they destroy our life. Uh, these modernity brings lots of problems with it. So we need to perhaps uh, develop new curricula for, for not only for students, for everyone, lifelong learning. And uh, we need to work, we need to stop teaching predictability because the future cannot be known. As the 2008 economic crisis, uh, the CFO of Goldman Sachs said, we observe movements uh, uh, beyond 25 degree, 25 standard deviation away of normal. Which, which means within one billion years, it could uh, be seen only once. So uh, by checking the previous trends, because the world is changing very rapidly, thanks to information technologies and um, communication technologies, we have machine learning, artificial intelligence, virtual reality, the end of geography, gene coded coding, and etc. cetera. So uh, to, to not to eliminate people, we need to create new GDP calculation, new metrics, happiness. And when we are creating a value, we are destroying some other values. So we can put a soft pressure on uh, companies, their goodwill. For example, what is the brand value of Microsoft? But if they are not paying respect to our common interest, to, to um, they are sending their waste disposal to the environment, they are causing uh, pollution and etc all together perception management you know value is a perception if uh, we disrespect their uh, activities all together we can decrease their value so they can be more respectful to how they create value we can do this we can measure their goodwill through their social contributions to the society or we can develop some other metrics uh, experts, scientists, officials like you working in these international organiza organizations, if you could be more independent, I am sure we can produce uh, much productive, effective metrics to, uh, to value what they create value, how they create value. Elif, thank you very much. You've been succinct and precise and give concrete suggestions on how to also change the metrics and change the the system that education should be uh, 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 should be shaped around. Uh, now let's continue uh, in this vein uh, with Obiora. Obiora, are you with us? Hello. I'm there. Okay, Obiora. Yes, uh, you are a theologist, a scholar, an author, and uh, you have intervened also in the previous session today. So you, we heard from you already. <laughs> Uh, as director of Globe Ethics Net, but uh, maybe you can uh, give us uh, some sense of what are the values uh, in uh, uh, also from a theological point of view that you think humanity should not only preserve but should uh, really put forward as uh, 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 as the, the the main reference. Eh? Uh, for 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 our own civilization. So, what are the the ethics that you think should be purported purported in higher education, uh, and uh, what action do you propose? Um, very thank you very much, um, Donato, and to all the colleagues um, from around the world. Um, the point is very um, clear that in a situation of uncertainty. 
human beings need to be stable about a few things. We need to be assured about specific values. We need to know what it is we can hold on to. On the platform of ethics, on the platform of values, we know that life is something every human being desires. Animals desire to live, not even those things that are plants. So life is a principle that each wants to have, wants to guard, wants to preserve. So building an ethics around life is a key component of the agenda, I think, that we must pursue following the question of pathways to transformation. The second point is to say that what we do at globeethics.net in Geneva is to build a global consensus of, especially on the youth, on their teachers who are found in higher education institutions. How do you ensure that higher education institutions transmit value? But how can higher education institutions get value and ethical orientation if the teachers do not have? If we look at the larger society and see the problems everywhere in the world, it starts small. If people steal, there is dishonesty, there is plagiarism, there is sexual harassment, there is wickedness, there is um, stealing, there is um, fake, um, uh, and so on. You will discover that these are things we consider unethical. But when people are taught in education, even from childhood, to behave in a certain way that guarantees them a certain integrity. When they do research around these topics, balancing it also with the rational mind, with finding out why I should do things rightly, knowing that to do them wrongly will result in an overall collapse. So this is where the action has to be. Action around protecting life, preserving life, so what Globetics has tried in the past few years to do is to look around the universe, to figure out how universities can partner with each other, to do research around ethics. Look at the rankings we do of universities, ranking about the best that have produced something scientific. There is no ranking around ethics, for example, about when they say knowledge and character. How do you measure character? But exactly upon character, all of us depend, the goodness of the other. So COVID is an invitation to think twice on the paradigms we took for granted in the past. In other words, to look back to say, education that is inclusive, education that has a platform that brings in others, education that is a fundamental right, Education, where currently we had it in the first panel that probably from Dr. Giannini, five billion human beings are out of school. Most of them live in countries of developing nations. And so you create already a gap, a gap of those who are going to school, who have access, and those who don't have due to many other reasons. How do we bridge this? So globeethics.net tries to use then the values of empowerment, of transformation, of integrity, of holistic approach, of competence, and even then of sustainability in building those values that society should call constant basic needs. It is a constant basic need. And on this, I would like to end this intervention. If we build a coalition around ethics, around values, we will be developing a new pathway to a world for everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much, Obiora. Uh, you perfectly answered my question. Uh, and, uh, and I think that your life-centered perspective is certainly a, a guidance for all of us. Uh, besides, I mean, you are uh, an excellent partner for, I mean, beyond being a, a fellow of the Academy uh, through Globetics, you are a, a very active partner 
of our uh, global leadership 21st century program with the United Nations. Uh, and uh, this is uh, of, of the greatest importance now, as you said, uh, the fact that we can uh, multiply our efforts and that we can combine them uh, in, in order to, to have really the impact that we would like to have. So the, all, all your um, different positions come together. I mean, your positions at Globe Ethics, other positions that we're going to hear from, I mean, they all are going to be reflected into uh, our ongoing uh, program with the United Nations. Um, thank you, Bjorn, again. I, I want to acknowledge also the presence of many uh, outstanding individuals. I mentioned Carlos before, but I see uh, Manfela as well. I see many people from the World Academy, Rodolfo, uh, uh, and, and many others, uh, Rodolfo Fiorini, uh, all, all of you, I hope you will stay with us because you will have the possibility of uh, uh, interjecting and continuing the discussion, uh, all those that I know and those I don't, I don't know. Uh, among those that I don't know yet, I see uh, Olivia, Olivia Bina, uh, Olivia uh, is a senior researcher of the University of Lisbon uh, and uh, um, Olivia uh, is also a fellow of the Academy, but we never had the opportunity of meeting yet, uh, but we're doing it through, through this facility today. Uh, Olivia, um, you know, in this quest for, for new leadership, uh, what is in your views the um, the way to to tackle the the, the you know the problem uh, is uh, is there a plurality of of strategies is there an approach that we should uh, follow uh, in uh, coming together uh, is there is a, a a way that we um, you know we can articulate different responses and different solutions how do you see this coming uh, forward. The, and again, the lingering question is still for you as well. Uh, you know, uh, up, up uh, winding roads or the super highways? What, what do you think should be the right combination? Uh, Donato, thank you very much. Uh, and thank you all. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, and I'm really grateful for the previous speakers because a lot of very important concepts have already been presented. So. Um, I, I want to say a couple of things um, trying to address Donato's challenge of, uh, on the issues he's posed. The first is that I find it extremely difficult to talk about anything at the moment without really starting from the situation that I feel we are in. And this somehow makes it difficult and very confusing um, most of the time. Um, and so my answer is very context specific. This is, I guess, what I want to admit. I mean, it may very much be my own limitation, but I don't feel um, it would be right not to state this. Uh, as far as uh, the challenge that we'd want to discuss here, I, I want to quote um, a, a sentence that I've used uh, often of late because it keeps speaking to me very deeply. It's a sentence that goes like this. Not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. And this is a quote from James Baldwin. It's a sentence that I keep hearing in my, my head. And as I witnessed the way we have responded to this crisis, I could not but go back to 10 years ago when I followed in great depth the crisis of the so-called financial crisis we had. And then I was surrounded by these enthusiastic words <coughs> of, from a crisis there will be an opportunity and the wonderful things that can arise from us all being locked into our homes. And this is the tension that I think is interesting right, perhaps to offer for us to think about because I have found myself totally torn between two worlds. I sit in a beautiful flat in the middle of Lisbon, and sure, 
this is a fabulous opportunity. First, I don't have to travel. I have time to think, do meditation, reflect on the meaning of life and the sense and purpose of it all. But I have friends who live in very different places and it is agonizing to think what they are living. And so every day I wake up and I think, am I going to look at the opportunities of this crisis or shall I collapse to the pain of what is happening? So I think that it is a time first to address some of the difficulties before we look for the beauty of the opportunities and the solutions. So forgive me if I'm not going to give wonderful solutions here. I don't feel it is the time for me to give them. I've done it in the past and I'm sure I can do it again in the future. But I feel that before we lead to that, um, we should perhaps, I should perhaps, I need to pause. And I want to offer a couple of other points. One word that I've never used in my professional life as an academic is violence. It's not a word I study or use. And yet, together with the quote from James Baldwin that I shared with you, it is a word that is occupying my days and my imagination. Why? Because I have shifted from thinking about the unequal treatment of life, and I'm really grateful for all those speakers who have emphasized that we're talking about all of life, not human life alone. And inequality has been, of course, linked to the economic side of things. It's a, it's a very convenient way of packaging a lot of the problems that we need to face and leadership needs to address. But I'm beginning to wonder whether uh, as Alberto Zucconi noted at some point in our notes, uh, we construct reality. Now, if we use the word inequality, are we doing a disservice to what actually the challenge is? Is not the challenge that our life and our world is absolutely violent in every possible dimension? If we change, if we switch from talking about inequality, which is already bad enough, and I can tell you lots of my colleagues don't particularly even like to engage with that concept, but we engage with the concept of violence. Will that make it different? Would we hear, feel a different sense of purpose and a different urge to lead in a particular way? So these are questions that I have and I don't have an answer, but to close, um, so if we can see the problem and we can face the problem and we can define the problem as that our systems are violent, cause violence and suffering, yeah? Can we then look at diversity and plurality as one possible route? Perhaps it's a motorway. I don't know whether it's a set of paths, maybe both as some of other speakers have spoken. What do I mean by diversity and plurality? Let me give you one example that I work on. Biodiversity and the policy of biodiversity. The United Nations has a convention on it, yes? And so on and so forth. We know that we are facing the sixth extinction, but it doesn't seem to matter very much. Even with this crisis, in theory, we could be talking a lot about life other than human, but we don't really do that very much. The point about the biodiversity convention as an example is that it shows how unable we are to actually embrace diversity and plurality. There are two different things. Plurality is basically the political discourse and the, this, the democratic space, yes? So biodiversity, uh, sorry, diversity and plurality to me emphasize the violence of the system that is global. And even I took issue uh, almost to, as a pun, but it's, it's perhaps useful. Our title is Pathways to Global Transformation. But global, which is different from connected, embodies also a huge amount of violence for a lot of us as globalization processes. And transformation begs the question, for whom and for what and why? And who wants to transform to what? So, I would need to open, I would like to open up those, all those questions before I find 
whatever motorway or pathway. But certainly one area where I'm trying to get my head around is the need for much greater space for diversity and plurality in whatever term we want to engage with. Thanks. Thank you, thank you, Olivia. Really appreciated your, your words, also your necessity that you expressed to, to have a pause, to uh, be, before acting, I mean, and, and we, we, we try to inspire thoughts for action through the academy, but it's always very important to make a pause, to hold on and, and then reflect and then, uh, and then say what we, we feel and what we think that can be constructed. So thank you very much. Again, uh, um, I think that Oppenheimer, uh, as wise as he, as he was, he was probably anticipating all this. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, now, uh, even if he was not the prophet himself, but certainly the prophecies are in front of us. But now you called, uh, you called in uh, Alberto, Alberto Zucconi, when uh, you mentioned uh, the, uh, the need uh, to look into the construction of reality that society uh, builds for itself. Alberto, are you with us? Yes. Uh, good afternoon to you. Alberto is a, a clinical psychologist, is also the co-founder with Carl Rogers of the Person-Centered Approach Institute, and uh, uh, he is an expert in, uh, in education, in higher education, and in, you, in the new paradigm for well-being of humanity. Uh, so my question to you, Alberto, is what does it take for a sustainable society? Uh, this is mainly the point because uh, also from the discussion we had before, we heard, uh, yes, sustainable is not enough. This is what, uh, uh, what Pavel was saying. Uh, maybe we need something more. Uh, what is the society that you think we should build? I mean, and how in a society can endure and can uh, be confronted with the shocks like the ones that we are confronted with right now and still withstand? Over to you, Albert. Thank you, and hi to everybody. Well, uh, I would say that, uh, first of all, uh, I don't think uh, we need uh, one uh, better and different society. That uh, would be a tragic mistake. We don't need the uh, one uh, society. Uh, <laughs> would be similar to dictatorship uh, that want to supply one uh, society and empires. We need uh, to be more aware and uh, although I would uh, speak about education, I'm not talking only about traditional education. As already Olivia at Chapney and uh, Obiora have pointed out, uh, and I agree with their, you know, underlining different things. Uh, what I call, it's not that I call, but uh, the sociology of knowledge uh, 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 underlines an obvious thing that uh, the world has not well understood. Even the people that want to change the world have not uh, understood. <laughs> Starting Marx and the big utopian. Well, we as people, we do not live in reality. You know, we are all hypnotized that we live in reality. And then we kill each other because uh, people do not agree with our reality. This is totally crazy. This uh, happened between a culture, between a country, but even in the family, you know. <laughs> what is uh, really uh, tragic uh, and uh, for a sustainable, but even prosperous society, is to be aware that, and that's why I find the education to be tantamount, is that, that not only in elementary school, but education that you receive when you're born from your parents and your peers, from the television for the fable, but of course, when you have a, a PhD in some topic and you read to delete, 
uh, believe uh, that you are a doctor in something, yeah, and for sure you're gonna be part of the problem, not of the solution, even if you are really good intentioned. The problem uh, is uh, that we see things uh, in one way, even when we promote uh, a change and when we promote uh, sustainability. The point is that, uh, you know, in the education, uh, we create uh, words, uh, we create uh, narratives, uh, and we are not aware of what kind of narratives. Chapney uh, underlines something I agree very much. We say, this nation is rich, and how we measure the national gross product. That's crazy. That is totally incompetent. That is not how you measure if that country is prosperous, because you don't measure with the general product how much destruction you have inside and outside. So if you have already measured the third, triple bottom line, quadruple bottom line that to measure, you know, societal impact, natural capital impact. And so in education, you have doctors still coming out. They know about the illness, but not how to defend and promote the health. And if they think they are health promoters, they're still blind because they mean a health promotion of Alberto Zucconi or Olivia Bina. And that is uh, worthless. We need the social help. And certainly ethics uh, is about uh, the blood, uh, the circulation, the pulsation, the breathing of social help. Like Obiora and also our friend uh, Shoshana from global, uh, from uh, the uh, interparliamentary coalition of uh, uh, for culture of peace and ethics. Yes, we, we should teach ethics, but actually we teach it. Every time you go to a movie, they are teaching ethics, <laughs> mostly the wrong one, the destruction one, the, the polluting one. When we say that is good, that is bad, that's ethics at work. Ethics is not uh, in uh, the courses of ethics. Uh, in everyday costume, construction of life, uh, when we open a TV, it's full of ethics, mostly about uh, able to become rich so you can consume a lot. So I think uh, uh, education is really tantamount. Uh, but not only in the social construction of a medical doctor, of an economist, of an architect, is how we build the reality, how we talk and speak and indicate the value. And I think it must really you know, be a tantamount for the people that want to promote change. But change, again, should be not one way, should be about a common denominator, an intercultural. So it should be a polysymphony of uh, stakeholders, everybody with the same respect, uh, the right uh, to be understood empathically, and uh, that uh, unite, uh, not uh, becoming a uh, the same of the others, uh, by you unite uh, on some basic uh, value, like uh, <laughs> the dignity of life, uh, and not only human life. Uh, and so I suggest uh, that uh, if we educate uh, each other by listening to each other with more understanding and respect and empathy, we could go a little bit ahead. Uh, and. Uh, also a lot uh, understanding not what is reality but how reality is construed so you can understand uh, how to use energy with a good uh, relationship uh, cost benefit uh, to promote uh, change uh, that is not only sustainable is also 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 
valuable to every living thing. That's it. Thank you, Alberto. Thank you very much for this uh, explanation, for your deep analysis, and uh, for, for also putting a lot of emphasis on the role of education for all of us, and uh, for, I would say, the, the importance of uh, uh, listening. Listening, you said, is so important, listening to others. And, and this construction of reality that somehow echoes the same uh, uh, issues that Olivia was mentioning before uh, when uh, she spoke about perceptions. I mean, the, the importance of capturing those perceptions that in the end become reality. Now, uh, we have uh, other two speakers in, uh, in this panel. The next speaker, Jerome. Jerome Glenn, are you with us? Yes, I can yes. see you. Uh, Jerome, uh, Jerome is a futurist, for those who don't know him, he is the executive director of the Millennium Project. Uh, Jerome, uh, we, from what we heard, uh, we are moving towards different scenarios in, in terms of the future uh, of humanity, in terms also of the leadership that we want to generate. Uh, what is your uh, understanding? What, where, in which direction are we moving? Um, and again, the question is also for you. Uh, do you have a preference in terms of the uh, small winding roads or the super highways? Or again, you think that we should use both? To you, uh, Glenn, uh, to you, Jerome, for five minutes. Okay. I think we should use both, and we should also use airplanes <laughs> and our imagination. Uh, I was asked to speak about uh, strategies pathways, so I thought I'd very quickly uh, make three points. The first is a strategy for the transition from the information age to the conscious technology age is building synergies between the knowledge of the technocrat and the attitude of the mystic. We are in the process of micro-miniaturizing technology, putting it in and on our bodies and externalizing our awareness and our knowledge and so forth into our physical environment. When we have a continuum between consciousness and technology in a way that we simply have a continuum here between I'm talking to you, and you're talking to me, but we're really not, we're talking to a machine, but we sort of create a, a, a perceptual space for that. When civilization does that, that would be a conscious technology civilization. If that civilization is good, in my judgment, it'll be because the mystic in ourself and in society and the technocrat in ourself and in society somehow work on those synergies to make it okay. The second point uh, is that the Millennium Project's 15 Global Challenges is a framework for understanding and anticipating global change. We've got to be able to wrap our mind around all of this and have a way of doing it. In biology, with the body, we have it. We have the respiratory system, the skeletal system, all these systems. So we have a, a, a system of understanding our, our biological functions. We can do this on a global basis. The 15 Global Challenges is our offering. Been doing that for 25 years, updating it, and it's a way of managing, uh, understanding a global change and where it may be going. The third point, uh, was very nicely made by the speaker from UNESCO about collective intelligence. We have created a global collective intelligence system in the future. It's very early, it's very embryonic, sort of like the Wright Brothers glider plane. We're not flying off to the moon yet, but it's a global futures intelligence system is a collective intelligence system to keep track of it all, so to speak, and support the participation of individuals and experts together in the system and global leadership so that people can understand the interactions of all of these things so that they're getting more synergistic uh, strategies. And these can address, of course, both security issues as well as opportunity. One of my big complaints uh, in all of this sort of stuff is we don't give equal time to the opportunity as we do to the, to the problem or, or the security issues. Um, and I think that we have to balance that. Uh, that's all I've got to say. Thank you, Jerome. Thank you. You you very sharp and and brief. Um, you know, we we all would like to use airplanes, as you said, but right now that's the only way to communicate. We cannot travel. I hope we will be traveling uh, more. Now uh, we continue traveling with our thoughts and and fantasy. Uh, and the next speaker is Jonathan Granoff. Jonathan, good afternoon to you. 
you are the president of the Global Security Institute. You are a lawyer, an accomplished writer, and uh, you are also uh, a great supporter and, and a great theorist uh, of uh, human security. So my, my question to you is really around uh, how do you see uh, uh, the world shaping up and what are the principles of human security that a new leadership should take into account? What are the most important principles of human security in an era that, of course, will still remain uh, 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 dependent and, and from, from many variables, uh, but we know for sure that uh, it's not uh, disarmament uh, only that makes us more secure, it's not uh, uh, fighting poverty only that makes us more secure, it's not only education that makes us more secure, it's really uh, coming together with a multi multiplicity of strategies and multiple approaches that can probably benefit uh, for, can be to the benefit of all. So to you, uh, the question also, the lingering question, what is uh, your preference, the winding up road or the, uh, the big highways? Jonathan. Thank you very much. Uh, this is a meeting with a lot of scientists. I think that science is a far better approach to addressing security than mythology. Presently, the vast amounts of money, intellectual resources, and focus of the major institutions that pursue security states is based on a series of myths. The major myth with the nuclear arsenals, the most uh, central pronounced threat to us all, of the activities of states is based on two principles. One is the pursuit of strategic stability. Strategic stability can never be measured. It can never be articulated very clearly. It changes each season. At one point, it was based on the theory of mutually assured destruction. We now know that if less than 1% of the 14,000 uh, nuclear weapons in the world were to go explode, it would throw millions of tons of soot into the stratosphere, and thus less than 150 of them would uh, destroy the agricultural base of the planet. So we've moved from mad to sad, self-assured destruction. What kind of pursuit of security could be rational based on the ongoing threat of self-assured destruction? based on an abstraction. That's a myth. The second myth is the pursuit of military superiority. That's the odd counterpart to strategic stability, and it's a contrary direction, actually. Again, a myth. It did not prove uh, realistic in the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, nor the NATO invasion of Afghanistan, nor the United States war with peasants in black pajamas in Vietnam military superiority in an age of high tech and increasing capacity of fewer people to do more harm in uh, less time with less resources is totally mythical. So I look at what are the real threats that we have and also these threats of nuclear annihilation and war, these are threats that we recreate in the concept of the security of the state in derogation of human security. Human security is the first duty of the state. The first duty of the state is to make the citizen secure. And in today's world, the, any state cannot make its citizens secure without global cooperation to address global threats. No major business can function in today's world without recognizing the global market. No individual's health can be secure without recognizing global health. Last I looked, viruses don't carry passports. They don't care whether you're rich, poor, black, white, Muslim, Christian, Jew. And uh, so we need to look at realism. What are the real threats that we face? That's what security is about. Real threats relate to the health of the phytoplankton. 
which is uh, organisms in the ocean that provide 50 to 70% of our oxygen. If that uh, ecosystem collapses, and it might collapse given the pollution of the oceans and the, the, the climate we're affecting, you and I and everybody on this call and everybody we know and everybody we love and all the grandchildren we might have will all die. That's real. And that's being, uh, that is being corrupted. The health of the phytoplankton is at risk because of another myth, which is an infinitely expanding economic order, mythical, because the planet doesn't sustain that. The very, the very health of the climates. I was in Greenland uh, last summer and I saw the billions of the billions of tons of fresh water that's been, you know, locked there for billions of years, just flooding into the oceans. You have to see the scale of it. If a hundred years ago we had planned on melting the polar ice cap, we wouldn't be able to do it. But now we've set up an economic order that's doing it. That's mythical. That's mythical thinking. The health of the topsoil, the health of the water table, the health of our immune systems. These are all measurable. They are all technically solvable. The problem is we are following mythical thinking. Now, I say we need to what I call progressive realism, which is applying the lessons that the scientific community has acquired to addressing the collective threats we have. Now, one of the impediments to this is the nation state system as the, as the locus of security. So we're pursuing secure states without secure people. It's absurd. We forget the origin of, this, of the modern state was largely to end uh, mythical thinking of whose definition of Jesus' love was preferred in Central Europe. And thus we had the treaties of Westphalia that stopped the 30 years war. So the purpose of the modern state was to express the value of peace and security. The modern state cannot obtain peace and security for its citizens without engaging in global cooperation focused not on the, on the mere security of the state, but on the security of people. So I am suggesting that all of the serious thinkers engaged in the World Academy and engaged in Moscow University and all the universities in the world and UNESCO and any people that are seriously thinking actually just understand that we're on the wrong bus. The bus of pursuing improved weaponry, if the goal is security, we end up with improved means to an unimproved end. The more we perfect the weaponry, the less security we obtain. We need to fundamentally move from mythical thinking to realism. And one last point. Human security, to be realistic, has to include an aspect of human beings that makes us a unique creature on the planet. Not only because of our intellectual capacity are we able to literally destroy the natural world, but we're also able to, uh, to express profound values. That's what makes us human. Compassion, love, justice. These are what make us human. So you cannot do realistic planning for a creature that's a moral creature that gives meaning to our very existence. An existence without love, an existence without justice and compassion is an empty existence. We don't just eat, sleep, defecate, and die, and procreate and die. We pursue meaning. And therefore, therefore, there are certain universal principles of ethics that we have to recognize and bring into practice. Of course, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is the most powerful, positive, law-oriented document we have. It's soft law, but it's positive law in a sense. The other is the golden rule, which you can find in every single religious and philosophical tradition in some iteration, every single one, because it comes from the architecture of being human. Little children, in, in all the studies, and when they hit about six, seven years old, they immediately have a concept of fairness. It's really because it's built into our humanity. We know that if you don't apply the golden rule in your family, chaos ensues. If you don't apply the golden rule in your personal life, you will never find inner peace and security. We need to apply the golden rule to the relations of nations. But human beings have a 
a higher calling, which we should never forget. And I'm going to end with a quote from one of the founders of the World Academy of Arts and Sciences, a un un unassailably recognized scientist of our time, that no one could say that he did not understand science. Albert Einstein said, oh youth, do you know that yours is not the first generation to yearn for a life full of beauty and freedom? Do you know that all your ancestors have felt the same as you do and fell victim to trouble and hatred? Do you know also that your fervent wishes can only find fulfillment if you succeed in attaining a love and understanding of people and animals and plants and stars so that every joy becomes your joy and every pain becomes your pain. So I know I have the honor of speaking to people in Russia and I'm in the United States and we saw the light of our common humanity when the Cold War ended and we are now seeing the darkness of the pursuit of insane myths of pursuing security by expanding and modernizing nuclear arsenals, existential weapons of horror and terror. It's for us to not allow these walls of fear and hatred to be rebuilt. It's for us to affirm our common humanity, use the tools of science, and get on with being human beings. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hey, I would like to say some words on behalf of the most curiosity. A few words. Uh, I would like to say about our competition, Kondrati Foundation, uh, and we would like to invite all participants of our session and of members of Club of Rome and World Academy of Art of Sciences to send your applications for the 10th international competitions of Kondrati Foundation. You can find information on the slide and I would like very say a few words um, about our research that we made uh, for the World Academy of Arts and Sciences. You can find it in one of new editions of the Journal of Academy. It's about a new paradigm of global society development and the era of global transformations. Um, we have start, we have examined global values in relation to ultimate development goals. We have identified three models of development. The idea of these models you can see on this slide. It's uh, I'm free. sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt, but uh, Professor Mambela Rampele has to leave. And, I will finish uh, in one minute if it's okay. possible. Thank you very much. So you can see here the three models. It's the first, second, and the third. And the idea of our research that it's very important in the post-COVID world. Uh, to uh, have the conditions for providing the new uh, model of development of the world. And you can find more information in, about our research. In, uh, we'll send this information to you. Uh, thank thank you, you very much. Okay, I have so to it was my, you have, uh, my you, you information. I jacked us a bit, but uh, although you said something very relevant, thank you very much. I wanted to conclude this panel discussion. Unfortunately, we do not have time for other interventions. I, we would have liked to have many. I just acknowledged only a few of the present individuals, uh, high-level individuals who are here today with us, uh, Thomas, Marcel, uh, many others I can see, uh, but it will be maybe for the next session to continue the discussion. So uh, thank you again for the high-level participation.